All right. Well, good morning and welcome to church. It's great to see you all. Great to see you this morning. Uh, yeah, today might be Super Bowl, uh, but men, don't forget that Valentine's Day is coming as well. So consider this my gift to you, reminding you that it's going to be Valentine's Day very soon. So if you don't have your stuff together, get it together and get ready for tomorrow. So there you go. All right. Um, so we're going to get into our message today, and we've been following along as, through our, our, um, our, our gospel project. And I'm excited, actually, as we uh, leave this section and go into the next section, uh, because we're actually kind of jumping over. You'll notice as you come into the next section that you sort of jump over Deuteronomy and go right into Joshua, and Joshua is just very exciting, and so it's, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, there's no real negative thing about jumping over Deuteronomy. A lot of Deuteronomy is like a recap, so a lot of the things that you will have read, you'll already have read if you went through that, and so just to, to let you know that. But we are still in numbers right now, and so we're here, um, and, and the title of our message this morning as we begin to go into it is called, uh, When Leaders Are Unfaithful, When Leaders Are Unfaithful. Uh, as we move along in our journey through the wilderness on our way to the promised land, um, we have seen the people of Israel, they, they do some things that, you know, they make us want to at times just sort of shake our head at. Um, whether it's blaming God, whether it's building idols, whether it's doubting, complaining, trying to start a coup. Uh, I mean, there are many things. But as you look around, you look at the Israelites, you say, hey, yeah, yeah, I get it. But Moses, you know, We've been following Moses. Moses, he seems to be quite a shining light amongst the darkness. Moses, you know, he's so faithful, so patient. I mean, he gets mad, but, but, but he, a lot of times he holds it together to follow the Lord. I mean, what a great example to follow on how to trust the Lord. And yet, and yet, even Moses stumbles. Even Moses is not perfect. As we all know too well, leaders are humans and as such struggle with the same desire as everyone else. And really, ultimately, when it comes down to it is they want to do their thing, deal with things their way, and really just be their own king to call the shots. We see this not just in the Bible, but in our lives today. You know, we, we've seen prominent leaders, prominent Christian leaders stumble and fall, and whether it be with money, with power, with sexuality. And it's always so shocking to us. And I think because we, we build them up in our minds, and, and we do that because we trust them. And, and when the, the trust is broken, it hurts. It can, it can hurt a lot. And whether this is a leader of a, of a big ministry or the leader of your family, like a parent, and, and what becomes very clear very quickly as we walk through life is that even the best of us are not perfect. We all struggle and stumble. Now, this is not an excuse. I do believe that leaders are, are held to a higher standard because people give you their trust. And that's a precious gift, and it needs to be treated with care. But there are times when these humans, they, they disappoint. The Bible sort of elevates three people as you look at the story of Israel. It, it elevates three people as the leaders, kind of, as Israel. You have Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, two brothers and a sister. And each one of them stumbled along the way. And as a result, each one of them, just like the rest of the first generation of Israel, were not allowed to enter the promised land. And today as we enter our text, the nation of Israel has been in the wilderness for about 40 years now. They're getting really close to coming to the gates again uh, of the promised land. And it's also the time when Moses stumbles. <laughs> He's had a very good run. Um, but even he misses the mark. And so if you have your Bibles, you can uh, turn to Numbers chapter 20, and we're going to read from Numbers 20, uh, verses 1 to 13. It reads like this. It says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And then why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. 
And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord. And through them he showed himself holy. Let's pray. Father, as we come again to your word, as we, as we do every week, we come to your word, God. And our desire as we come, as we gather together, is to, to worship you, to lift up your name, and, and to hear what you would want to speak to us. And so, God, we, we, we open your word, and we've done that this morning. We open your word. And now, Lord, we, we just invite your Holy Spirit to come and, and to teach us and to speak to us and to show us and reveal yourself to us, Lord, through it. And so, God, I pray for each one of us that, that our hearts and our minds would just be, be open to, to hear and understand what, what you want to say to us, God. And so we welcome your Holy Spirit to come and, and just be our teacher this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our text, as you begin in, in Numbers chapter 20, it begins with the death of Miriam. Uh, in a way, it's a signal of this generation dying. For those who may have lost track of Miriam in all that's going on, um, Miriam was Moses' sister. She was the one who kept an eye on Moses when Moses had, uh, when Moses' mom had stuck baby Moses in the basket, you know, and sent him uh, on the Nile. She was the one that, that sort of kept an eye on him. Miriam was referred to in Scripture as a prophetess. She was the one who led them in the singing of the first worship song uh, that's found in Scripture in Exodus chapter 15, right after they came to the other side of the sea when God had parted the waters. Uh, She was also part of the leadership that sort of turned on Moses and rebelled just before they came to the gates of the promised land for the first time. And now here they are. They've been in the desert probably around 40 years, and Miriam dies. It's a sad day for the people. It's a sad day for Moses, his sister, who had watched over him, who for the most part was with him. The three of them, in many ways, shared this experience together. Moses, his brother Aaron, and his sister Miriam. And right after she dies, as they're looking, the water runs out. They as a nation, right after Miriam dies, are thrust into crisis. On their journey from Egypt to the promised land, the the Bible marks out three sort of water crises that Israel faces. One, when they first leave Egypt, they've been traveling for a few days, and they're walking, and they run out of water, and and they come to some springs, and they're like, yay, we're saved, only to find out that the water is bitter. And so Moses throws some sticks on it, the water becomes drinkable, and God takes what was bitter and harmful and makes it good and useful for them. As they move along uh, on their journey, they come to the next water crisis, and you find that in Exodus 17. And God tells Moses to go and to strike the rock, and out of the waters, uh, and out water will come. And so Moses does, and sure enough, water comes out of the rock. And these two moments, they happen in the first leg of their journey, and now now we are at the end of their journey, at this sort of 40 years later, and another water crisis comes, and they're scared. They're in the wilderness and, and don't know what to do. It's interesting what people will do in the middle of a crisis. Are they calm? Um, are they level-headed? Some are. Uh, some people you want in a crisis, and then there are people that kind of lose it. They freak out. Well, as we read, we see what Israel did. They decide that they're going to get a a posse together, and and they're going to go and deal with Moses, and they fight with him. They accuse him. They they blame him. I mean, leadership can be so much fun, can't it, right? 
starts out, he said, would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Or it would have been better if we had died when our brothers died, when God killed them for their rebellious ways. That would have been better than dying like this. Verse 4, why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? We're here in this place, they're saying, because of your leadership. Therefore, this is your problem. Why did you bring us here to kill us? In verse 5, and then why have you made us come up out of Egypt? I'm, as I read that, and I'm not sure where you are if you read before or after, but as I read that, I thought, are, are they still wanting to go back to Egypt? It's been 40 years. I'm thinking, let it go. Do you still want to go? I mean, I would have said, you know, <laughs> have fun. See you later, guys. It's been good. So they say, you know, why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grains or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. We're in the middle of nowhere, and we have nothing. It's been 40 years of walking around the wilderness. We have none of the things we used to have. Oh, Egypt was so good, wasn't it? As we talked about last week, they distort their memory of the past. And the irony here is that when they were first at the gates of the promised land 38 years ago, the things they mentioned that they didn't have are some of the fruits that they found in the promised land that God wanted to give them a long time ago. But they wouldn't trust God enough to go in. What do you think is going through Moses' mind right now? I can tell you what's going through my mind as I'm, I'm reading this, and I can actually tell you what's going through his mind too, and it's, it's the same thing. If, if it wasn't for you whiny, complaining, rebellious people, I could have been in the promised land drinking pomegranate juice 38 years ago. I was willing to trust God, but because of your choice to decide that you knew better than God, here I am leading you lot, wandering through the wilderness for 38 years. I think Moses was getting really to his wit's end. Maybe I'm just getting to my wit's end. Reading about this, I don't know. But I, I think I know he was because the text shows it. But also not just here, it also shows it in Psalms. Psalms speaks of this moment. I mean, Moses is a patient guy, but, but he's about to lose it. And so what does he do? He does what he's always done. He, he went to the Lord. I mean, wouldn't that be great if that was our response too? I mean, the scripture doesn't say that he sort of responded to them or said this or that to them. It just says that right after they came, they did all this accusing, him and Aaron, they, they went to the Lord. And I think a lot could be learned just from that, that when trouble comes, our first response is, not to, is to go to the Lord, not necessarily to fight or run or freeze, but, but to go to the Lord. And it'd be great to have that habit of just going to the Lord and letting him speak into the situation and speak to us. I mean, I think we would be way better off than a lot of the trouble that I know that I can get into. And so Moses and Aaron, they meet with the Lord, and maybe Moses is hoping God will say, look, Moses, you know, hold on to your hats because it's go time, and I'm going to wipe the rest of them out right now. But he doesn't. What does he say? He says, go get the rod. The rod is a symbol of his, his authority, but it's even more a symbol of God's authority. It was the rod that God used to bring the plagues on Egypt. It was used many times throughout their journey. Go take the rod and then tell the rock to bring forth water. Like, what, God? Don't tell them to prepare for some great judgment. Don't tell them how bad they are, how unfaithful they are. Just go and talk to the rock. Usually Moses and God shared their disappointment in the people and their lack of faith. But here it seems a bit maybe one-sided. I mean, usually God says, okay, let me wipe them out and we'll start again with you, Moses. And then Moses says, no, no, we can't do that. Here God just says, take your rod, go talk to the rock. And I'm pretty certain that Moses was not a happy camper. And so he grabs the rod and calls the people together. And then instead of speaking to the rock, telling the rock to bring forth water, he unleashes in a lot of ways on the people. All right, people, you had your time to come and tell me what you think about me and my leadership. Well, listen up. In verse 10, it says, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, 
And Psalms, it talks about how he spoke to them in such harsh tones and harsh words. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? The, the rebel here, the word rebel here is not just sort of misguided, like, you know, they misunderstood. The word rebel here is the word of a willful choice to go against. You're not just sort of seeing things from a, from a wrong perspective. You're, you're, you're willfully going against God. This is a choice that you are making with a clear head. And then Moses turns around and he strikes the rock. I, I think he strikes it out of anger, m- mostly like in a way of rage at the people, maybe anger even towards God. I, I don't know. Forgiving these rebellious people, because they are rebellious of what they want. And this action here ends up barring Moses from entering the promised land. Verse 12 says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, because you didn't believe me, because you didn't trust me enough to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. That my plan was the one to be followed, not yours, Moses, not your anger. That my plan trumped what you felt in this moment, which shows me as holy. Because this again, listen, it's not about you, Moses. I'm using you for my purpose, not the other way around. This isn't the God and Moses show. This isn't about the Marcel or God and God show or anybody else in God show. This is very simply about the Lord and His plan, His holy plan. Now there's a connection to Jesus that Paul actually makes in, in Corinthians that, that give us an idea that there's more going on here than, than Moses can even understand at this point. He goes on, it says, therefore, God says to, to, to Moses, he said, therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Because you didn't trust me, because you didn't believe, you can't go in. And remember, as we spoke about last week, the only way into the promised land is through faith, to, to trust God. And so God says to Moses, I'm sorry, but you can't go in. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, we, we see that we've got three groups, of, of peop- three groups here. We, we have Israel, we have the leadership, and we have God. And, and I want to take a, a look just for a minute at each of these groups and, and, and see what we learn from this event. And maybe what God would want to even speak to us here today in this moment. We, we've come to gather to not hear Marcel talk, but to hear what God would want to speak into our very lives. And, and not just to hear, but so that we could ultimately align our lives with what God is saying. And so the first group of people that we see as we, we look at this is, is the Israelites. And what do we see? I think we, clearly as you read this, you, we see a pattern. And really it's a pattern of sin. And so point one is that continued unfaithfulness leads to a pattern of sin. As you look at the first section, you see the people of Israel. When we read it, we maybe chuckle a bit. We say, oh, here we go again. It sounds so familiar. Where have we heard this before? It's a pattern that seems to plague these first generation Israelites. How'd they get into this pattern? Unfaithfulness. Now, we know from last week that faith is how we enter and live in the kingdom. And we saw what kept them out of the promised land. It was this lack of faith, a lack of trust. When you, when you live in such a way that you are constantly not trusting God, not faithful or full of faith, but unfaithful, that continue to choose to do our own thing, it leads to a pattern of sin. And this we see in in, in their lives. This is roughly at the 40-year mark of wandering in the wilderness. And you might ask, you know, if you had an opportunity to sit down with them as a group, you might say, hey, Israel, you know, what have you learned so far, right? Israel, how have you grown during your, your 40 years of walking with God in the wilderness? It would seem that they have not grown. It would seem it's the same thing over and over and over again. But lest we point the finger at Israel, this is not only Israel. We see this in us too. There can be times and and places in our lives where we continue to say, I know better than God. Yes, God, you have ideas and they're good, but I choose to do my own thing in this area of my life. 
And that choice will ultimately, if you continue to make that choice, will lead to a pattern of sin in our lives. And so I would encourage us all just to take a, take a minute and to, to think about our life. Are there areas where, where you're going round and round and round? And you say, why do I keep doing this? It's not what God desires, but I continue to do it. It's a, it's a pattern of sin. And I'll bet you it's because there was a time where you decided that you knew better. And you dealt with whatever it was on your own, on your own terms, in your own way, apart from God. And as you continued to do it, it built a a, a pattern that you continue to return to. I have always dealt with this struggle, this issue, this thing, this way. And so as you move along through life, it becomes how you do it. And it becomes a pattern uh, of sin. Now, a lot of times this happens when you don't know the Lord, and so obviously you won't rely on Him, but there develops again a pattern of dealing with things in our lives. And then we come to Jesus, and you find it very hard to break this destructive pattern, or, or you didn't know Jesus, but as you go through your life for whatever, you knew Jesus, and as you go through your life for whatever reason, you said, you know, I'm, I'm going to actually do my own thing here. God, thanks for the advice. Thanks for your scripture. I'm sure it's good, but I'm, I'm going to do my own thing here. And you do. And you end up in a pattern that that you now feel like you can't get out of. Either way, you feel trapped in a cycle or pattern of sin that was brought on by consistently not being faithful, not trusting in what God has spoken. And so here we have the Israelites, and when when they hit an issue like this, they blame, they curse, they want to turn away from God. It's their MO in the wilderness, really. So one, what do you do if if you're in this pattern? Well, first, I I would really encourage you to find someone that you trust and speak to them about it. Repent of it and pray together about it. You say, you know, look, I find myself continually tripping up here, and I don't know why, but I want that area to come into alignment with God and what God would be saying, to really trust God here and His words into my life. And I'd highly suggest you do something. Maybe, maybe there are things that, that can help you begin to, to take apart some of that stuff and begin to see those areas where you, where you really didn't say yes to God in specific areas. Things like we run them at our church. We run the freedom sessions. Uh, we run Genesis process. That's what they're about, freeing us from these patterns that cause us bondage. Second, how do you keep from going down that road? Because all of us are capable of that. And I think one of the ways is, is keeping short accounts with the Lord. Owen used to talk about that, keeping short accounts with the Lord. And that's, that's about repenting often, not allowing that to become the way of life for us, which, as we see, develops into patterns of sin in our life. Continued unfaithfulness leads to patterns of sin in our life that can end up taking over. So too, as we, as we move along in the text, we, we move from these unfaithful people with this pattern of sin, and, and you come to Aaron and Moses. Okay, we say, now we're going to get some good stuff. No, not so quickly. And here is a, here's a great example as to, to why the Bible is not about a bunch of heroes of God. Because even in the most faithful, at times, are unfaithful. Even Moses uh, is, is at times and the Scripture shows us anything about man, it's that you cannot put your trust in them. They will eventually let you down. And we see that here. Again, we see that unfaithfulness results from a failure ultimately to trust God. And so even in Moses, who's been so good for so long, The people start railing on Moses and Aaron, and so Moses and Aaron approach God in reverence. They come and they they fall before the Lord, and we say, yeah, great start, guys. I mean, we kind of expect that from these two, don't we? Their pattern is actually being faithful for the most part. So we would expect that kind of response from them. But then God responds maybe differently than they expect, maybe differently than they want. He responds to the people with grace. I'm not sure what Moses thought about that. These people, really God? I mean, did you hear their their accusations? Did you see their hearts? They're not worthy of your grace. Maybe as we mentioned, what, what God should have said, you know, what we would want him to say is, yeah, let's wipe them out and let's start again. But give them what they want? 
Sometimes what God asks us to do, we don't want to do. We've talked about this in the past, but it's, it's really the clash of wills. When God's will meets our will and they do not agree. Many people are fine with God as long as they both agree. God, as long as we're on the same page, I'll follow you, no problem. But what happens when we have a clash of our wills? What happens when we disagree? And here we see Moses and God, maybe not quite on the same page. And truthfully, if you were Moses, I mean, could you blame him? No, I probably feel the same way. Matter of fact, Moses lasted much longer than I would. I'm absolutely sure of it. But how about us today? What do you do when your will and God's will don't agree? What God calls us to is to trust him. To trust him. And sometimes we won't fully get it. We won't fully understand. Sometimes we'll want to do something else. They deserve this, God. Don't you see that? They deserve this. And God's speaking to us. Yeah, but you need to love. You need to forgive. You need to show grace. And sometimes we won't want to do it. And right now in our life, is there an area where God and you do not align? And don't think for a minute that just because, you know, you had a great time in church, it's all good. You know, well, we had a good time. Andrew lists some good, good songs, and oh, it's, it's really great to see everybody. I mean, Moses and Aaron, they had, a, they had a real meeting with God, and it was good. They had a good service, I would say. They had a good service together. But when they left, well, they did their own thing. It's great to have a good time meeting with God, and, and it's important. But when we leave, what will we do with what He's spoken to us? How will we respond? How will we step out and trust what, what he has said? Your Sunday's great, but Monday's a part of that. Tuesday's a part of that. Sunday's not a separate event. It's part of the whole. I mean, does it really matter what happens in the tent with Moses and God if it doesn't affect what happens when Moses leaves the tent? I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like Moses didn't want to be part of extending grace to a people who did not deserve it. Which, as you think about it, that's exactly what grace is. Unmerited favor. It's favor that's not earned, not deserved. It's giving love to people who don't deserve it. Forgiving people who don't deserve it. Serving people who don't deserve it. God wanted to extend grace. Moses did not. And so we have a clash of wills. And in the end, Moses does what he wants to do instead of what he needs to do. And that's to trust God. I feel this way towards these people, but God, you're saying this, okay, I'm going to submit that. I'm going to trust your plan. I'm going to trust you, God. But that lack of trust led to an unfaithful way of living. We can't be faithful if we won't trust him. And so we must, must look at our lives. We must ask the Spirit of God to examine our lives. Is there an area, God, where, where you know, I hear you, but I'm, I'm, I don't really trust you? And that'll change how we live out our, our faith, really. Do I, do I trust you, God? It'll change how we live that out. Do I trust you with my future, the things that are happening? You know, our world seems so uncertain right now, <laughs> you know? And so I can act in a certain way to kind of respond to it, but maybe God's speaking to us in another way, right? Do I trust you, Lord, with my future? Do I trust you with my relationships? Do I trust you with the issues of my life right now? There's a bit of an examination that we just invite the Holy Spirit to come and to speak into our heart and say, God, is there, is there anything here that I'm not trusting you with? Thirdly, um, third party we see in this passage is God. And it reveals a few things about God. And one of the aspects of God that it reveals is that God is holy. And we discover in this passage is that unfaithfulness brings about the judgment of a holy God. And you might think, well, well, this is Moses, right? You know, I don't know if you've read this passage uh, before or not. If you have, you've probably read it and you've probably thought, man, God just seems so mean, <laughs> you know, so harsh on Moses, you might think, well, this is Moses. I mean, he should get a pass. If anyone should get a pass. He's been faithful for so long, God. He's been looking after these Israelites for so long. 
God, we might say, this is kind of harsh. I mean, if you wipe out those other Israelites, okay. But, but I mean this, is for Moses. And here's the thing. With God, he, he is holy. And it doesn't matter if it's Moses or if it's Aaron or if it's the disciples or if it's Billy Graham or if it's Mother Teresa. Because God is holy. Judgment comes on unfaithfulness, period. And so Moses is not allowed to enter the promised land. He'll be able to look at it. And if you wonder what his view might have been, you can, do you have that picture I showed you? Because I was always curious. Do you have it up there or no? Yeah? Okay. When you come, what you'll see here, is it there? No. <laughs> so anticlimactic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can give as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there when you put it up anyway. When you see it, if you see it, um, it was a picture that I took last time I was on Mount Nebo, which is where Moses actually looked out towards the promised land. He, he can look at it, but he can't go in. To get into the promised land, it takes faith. As we said last week, and, and, and Moses, because of your lack of trust here, you cannot go there. Does God love Moses? Oh, absolutely. But he can't overlook sin. And so we might think, you know, as we look at that man, Moses has been so faithful for his whole life, one mess up and he can't go into the promised land. And if Moses can't get it right, then what hope do any of us have? I mean, really. Really? Let's be honest. Moses is a much, much better man than me. I do not think that I would have, as I've said many times throughout this sermon, I do not think I would have lasted walking around putting up with all the nonsense for 40 years. He did. I mean, if Moses couldn't get in, what hope do any of us have with a holy God? Not much. Actually, none. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Scripture actually says that all of us fall short. And this leaves us in an interesting place. However, we also discover two other things about God in this passage, and that is He is gracious and that He is faithful. And so because He is gracious and faithful, water pours out of the rock towards this faithless group. They will not enter the promised land, but we see He does provide water from the rock, even when Moses does it wrong, even when all the people are grumbling. And listen, there is more to it that, that, than his not just doing it wrong. There's a lot going on in here, as I mentioned, with, with his example and what he wants to teach um, through it. And so even in Moses' though unfaithfulness you know, towards God and what he's been called to do, God still is faithful. And water still comes out of the rock. God is gracious to these grumbling people. And we find this consistent with who God is all the way throughout Scripture, particularly at the cross. We see the judgment of a holy God on sin, on your sin, my sin, and the sin of the world. All the sin that keeps us from entering the presence of God, because God, God's a holy God and, and nothing gets by that. But instead of pouring that judgment out on you and me, he pours out His judgment on His Son, Jesus. And Jesus takes our punishment. What hope do we have? None, except for Jesus. And if we come through Jesus, we can enter in a way the spiritual promised land. And so God invites the world, come. You are welcome. Come, all of you. Come and drink the water. But because of our unfaithfulness, the only way to do that, to come, is to come through Jesus. The one who took that judgment upon himself. The judgment that was meant for us. Yes, God is holy and he's full of grace. And he extends it to all who would receive it. My question to you today is, have you received it? You can, and it starts really by just coming to the Lord and admitting that you, you have sinned, you've done your own thing, gone your own way, and even at your best, you've missed the mark. Maybe like Moses. 
So, Lord, we say, well, well, I deserve to be denied entrance into your presence and enter, entrance into your sort of spiritual promised land like Moses. I deserve that. I want to receive that which you offer. Forgiveness for the sin that I've committed because of what you did on that cross for the world. And so very simply, you come and you say, Lord, I, I received that for me, for my life. And then you come and say, I thank, I, as I receive that, I thank you that you now receive me with open arms as I receive your gift of grace. So do we see the unfaithfulness of man in this? Oh, absolutely. But more than the unfaithfulness of man, we see a holy God who extends grace. We see a God that is greater than even our sin. Whatever we're wrestling with today, I want to encourage you to, to bring it to the Lord in, in this place. And as you leave today, to, to trust Him and follow His lead. Not just today, but tomorrow too. God is holy, yes. Yes, He is. And He's faithful. And He's full of grace. We're going to invite our worship team to come and to lead us in one last song before we close.